Hi, uh, greetings everybody and good morning from California. Good afternoon in parts of Arizona and then good afternoon uh, for our folks uh, out in the mountain time zone. Welcome, it's nice to see all the participants coming in. So welcome, we're very excited today to have our second official webinar for the Native Center. And we have a, a very special guest and she's actually part of our team with the Finds Their Way Project, our youth transition program. And Treva Roanhorse is the former uh, executive director of Navajo OSERS, Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services and the Vocational Rehabilitation Program as well. And that's where I got to learn back in 1993 is the first time Treva and I crossed paths almost 30 years ago now uh, to where I was freshly out of school and wanted to learn about how does a tribal VR program work in Indian country? So I was very fortunate to be able to spend uh, uh, over a week in Navajo country and visiting many of the site offices throughout Navajo Nation. And of course at Window Rock is the head office, but they have other offices in other communities providing uh, vocational rehabilitative services and under the uh, Office of OSERS, they had independent living services and other disability supports. So I really learned a lot from Treva and Navajo Nation as the first tribal VR program funded back in the 80s, which I'm sure she will share some of that story. But it's just my great pleasure to have Treva on our team and working with us. And again, we're going to do the best to answer all questions as we can. If not, always be feel free to follow up with emails and things of that nature. We did get a couple emails from our last webinar that we were able to communicate with folks with as well. So please share your questions and your comments in the chat. Uh, Jeff's going to try do his best to see if we can answer all those questions. But with uh, uh, no further delay, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Treva Roanhorse, one of our disability mentors in Indian country. So welcome Treva, we're looking forward to having you today. Palamia. Thank you, Jimmy. Good morning, my name is Treva Roanhorse, or good afternoon, as Jimmy introduced. Today, uh, I'm gonna be going over the Tribal Vocational Rehabilitation Program, the vision, the advocacy in the community of the history of uh, American Indian Vocational Rehabilitation Project. Um, as Jimmy indicated, I was the former director of the Navajo Nation Special Aid and Rehab Services, and also president of KNAR, the Consortium of Administrators for Native American Rehabilitation. Um, I was after I stepped down as president, I was chair of the policy and advocacy committee for KNAR, um, which you know um, has continued to grow and moving forward. So I will also do an overview on KNAR uh, part of this uh, presentation. Next. Today, um, the goals and objectives would be the overview of the history of American Indian VR services um, and also the beginning, how it started, uh, the advocacy, the cultural appropriateness for VR services. Part of that included traditional healing and then preparing our tribal members for successful outcome because vocational rehabilitation, the outcome is employment. The objective is to, that hopefully you guys will learn about the, uh, how tribal VR program was established and then the, some of the highlights and the events that got us there and the provision of VR services and also the creation of KNAR. Next. Um, I don't know how many of you know Dr. Elmer Guy. Elmer Guy was the first tribal VR director uh, back in the 1970s. Um, he worked really hard to, with uh, the RSA office. And at that time they had regional offices and he worked closely with um, Dr. Herb Leibowitz out of San Francisco in region 10, I mean, region nine uh, to start moving forward because there was a, the increase of cases with the travel, with the Arizona RSA of Navajo referrals, you know, that there was an increase of that. And the nearest office was in Flagstaff for Arizona. So they came to Navajo and said, you know, we're getting a slew of increases. Um, at the time, 
vocational rehabilitation was something that wasn't in existence on Navajo and I don't believe any other Indian reservations and Indian communities. So with that, Arizona, Arizona RSA used to have an establishment grant that they awarded. And with that, uh, they asked Dr. Guy to, you know, submit a grant application for innovation and establishment of travel VR program. At that time, it was called Navajo Vocational Rehabilitation Program. Um, today, Dr. Guy is the president of uh, Navajo Technical University, and Dr. Leibowitz really worked closely with Elmer um, and going to the Senate hearings introducing during the amendments of 1978 of the Rehab Act to include uh, tribal vocational rehabilitation program in the act to ensure that you know the tribes can establish their own tribal VR programs and provide their own services. So they work uh, hard on that and including that provision into the amendments of the 1978 Rehab Act. Next. Here's the history, some of the history of the 1980s from 1981 to 1985. Navajo Nation was the only tribal VR program in the country. And it was under section one, section one part D, section 130. The first uh, four years, Navajo Nation was the only tribal VR program across the country. Of course, with a match from the Navajo Nation, which is 10%. And during that time, cases were transferred from the state VR agency from Arizona, 162 cases, New Mexico, 55 for Navajo Nation to establish their own travel VR program, administer it, and you know, expend the funds. Prior to that, we were getting funds from Arizona, but not enough to you know, uh, provide the services that we needed because Navajo Nation is in a tri-state area, Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. But the main, the main lead that we worked with for the state VR state it was Arizona. They took the lead. They worked with us. Uh, they also signed uh, a state supervisor to us to supervise and help us establish the tribal VR program. Um, we used their travel, we, we used their VR forms and start opening cases and moving, you know, moving the case, establish the case management system. Uh, having our own allocations of funding without having to depend on the state for, the, for client services, and then start hiring staff, vocational rehab counselors, and support staff. So that's what we did during that time. And then in 1985 and 86, other new programs were established under by the tribes, the Northern Cheyenne, the Chippewa Cree, the Shoshone Bannock, and the Salish Kootenai up in Montana. They came to the table and also were funded. And during that time, Elmer and Dr. Leibowitz, they kept going back and forth to DC to ask for allocation. But once the, 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 once the other tribes started getting funding, the allocation was automatically you know, put into the, uh, to the set aside because it's a, five, it's a three year discretionary set aside funding. And then there was an amendment again during the, the reauthorization of amendments in 1986 that, fo that focused on the needs for travel for tribes on the reservation to improve and the provision of comprehensive uh, VR services for American Indians living on and near the reservation. And you know, they strengthened the commitments uh, of services and providing culturally appropriate VR services. What we meant by culturally appropriate VR services is there was traditional healing. The other thing is that the majority of the Navajo tribal VR staff uh, spoke the language. They were members of the tribe. They, you know, we had to look at the different things that includes in our culture and providing that services. But we had to understand and, you know, what the col why culture is, was very important and very appropriate to be included as part of the VR services. The other thing that happened was an American Indian Rehabilitation Research and Training Center was established at Northern Arizona University with the Institute for Human Development. They did a lot of research, they did training, they provided that support system to travel VR programs. Next. 
And these are some of the staff, the purse, the lady that's um, from the left on the third, Priscilla Sanderson. She was, one, she was the second uh, director of uh, AirTech. The first, the first person that ran the uh, AirTech Center was uh, Dr. Marilyn Johnson from Laguna. And then after that, you know, uh, other individuals came on board to be to, to work with AirTech and also work with the tribes. There was also another program that was funded at the University of Arizona. Um, so there were two uh, research and training centers that were established. Next. In the 1990s, that's where a lot of things happened. The 1992 amendments plus the 1998 amendments. There was an increase in funding. Um, also, there was also the establishment of the Consortium of Administrators for Native American Rehabilitation. At the time, there was only a little over 3 million, but there was an increase in funding, which I will show you in, uh, later on into the uh, presentation. There was also 10 points priority preference that was added for those programs that, like for Navajo and those programs that have been funded that had received their second year funding, third year funding, they were they automatically received 10 points to their grant application because it was a competitive, because it's a competitive grant. The other one was that the allocation, the physical allocation was less than 1% of one, less half of 1%. And that was increased to one fourth of one half of the 1%. That's a tongue twister. Uh, then the grant was also expanded from a three-year discretionary grant to five-year discretionary grant. One of the things that when we came, when the KNAR was established, one of the things we looked at was we're competitors among each other, but we decided that that's not going to stop us to come together and work with each other among the tribes. That was, uh, that was really important to do. Also, the development of strategies to address the on and near reservation that was left at the discretion of the tribes. Like for Navajo, we said 20 mile radius outside the reservation line because a lot of our people, a lot of our students, they transition off the reservation for employment, for education, and then, but their main uh, residency is on the reservation. So that discretion was left up to the tribes to define and you know that was, we usually put that in our grant when we replied. And then the two things, the two areas that we introduced of the 22 amendments, the two areas that were not considered was permanent uh, RSA funding for travel VR programs to establish a community rehab programs. Those were not considered. But out of the 22, uh, 20 were you know uh, changes were made. Uh, the RSA also designed a reporting system for the national database that counts the, the rehabilitation outcomes, the total number of clients served uh, based on the annual reports that we submitted. And then the Workforce Investment Act of 1998 was established. And under there, section four was where American Indian, I mean, where uh, the Rehabilitation Act was put into place under the Workforce Investment Act. And then section 130 part D of travel VR was changed to section 121 part C. We provided a lot of, we provided testimony during the annual KNR conference in Seattle, Washington, and we got a lot of support from other national organization on our amendments requests. Next. American Indian vocational rehabilitation is, you know, provide appropriate vocational rehabilitation services to American Indians and Alaskan Natives who reside on and on, on or near federal and state reservation Alaskan villages. You know, it's based on their strengths, resources, priorities, concerns, informed choices. So they may prepare for, for and engage in employment outcome. That's what vocational rehabilitation services is. Next. Now I'm going to go to the Consortium of Administrators for Native American Rehabilitation. For your information, this logo here was established, was put together by um, Rusty. Um, oh gosh, his name escaped me. It was an individual, uh, and 
he was Cherokee. He was an individual with a disability. He's the one that came up with this logo, and he was somebody that was in a was in a wheelchair. So you know, um, he's the one that designed this logo for us. Next, during the one of the reauthorization of the Rehabilitation Act, we have cultural diversity. Our CDI was established to reflect the cultural diversity of society, to promote opportunities, equal access and services for individuals who are culturally diverse. With that, uh, the University of Northern Colorado uh, took, that, took that initiative and started, wanted to work with the tribal VR programs to have to establish an organization that would be the voice and the advocates, advocacy for tribal VR programs. So that's how KNAR was established. And the person that um, was the head of the overall RCDI was Dr. Bobby Atkins from San Diego State University. Next. And under the leadership of Dr. Ken Naliai and his staff, uh, KNAR was established in Denver. We came together in Denver there were six of us at that time we were still 130 programs uh, there was sydney claymore from standing rock mike hermerson from salish rusty Cantrell from cinnabon sioux steve galby from chippewa Cree, maria estes from lower brule and myself we met with dr dr ken naliai and his staff and we talked about what KNR was going to be doing as a voice and ears uh, for tribal VR programs, what is it that we needed to do to ensure that? Because what was happening was tribes were being funded. And then after three years, some of them were being defunded. And, you know, we needed to really address that. So there is, you know, so there, the programs continue because once you're providing services, if your program's not refunded, where does that leave your consumers? So we really had to address that. We also wanted to have our own, um, grow our own professionally of uh, tribal VR staff, counselors, directors. So we met on that and that's how KNR was established. We also really needed to establish a partnership with the state VR agencies, with the Rehab Services Administration, with the regional rehab, regional continued ed programs, and CSAVR, the, the state VR agency organization, and even tribal governments, in order to, met, to meet the needs of our consumers on the reservation. Next. Currently, the, uh, we have amended uh, the mission of KNAR uh, by the KNAR board. The current uh, mission of KNAR is a collaborative voice of many tribal nations to honor and empower Alaskan Natives and American Indians through education and advocacy. The vision is full inclusion of American and Alaskan Natives with disabilities. And the primary goal is to be nationally rec recognized advocacy program to influence you know, policy funding legislation in the areas of values, education, advocacy, accountability, culturally centered inclusion, innovation, and honor. Next. Due to the process of the reauthorization of 1996, this is what I had mentioned, the 22 amendments that we submitted um, to RSA, to the federal government of amendments. I'm not gonna read each one of them, but you know, this is for your information. One of the things that's really important is that all tribal VR programs, directors serve on state rehab advisory council because that's, it's really important, even those uh, states where there are no tribal VR programs, because, you know, they have a say, because some of this, not all um, tribes have tribal VR programs. So they're the advocates, they, you know, um, they're at the table and working with the state. The other one is that there's a greater need for independent living services on the reservation. So it was important for tribal VR programs to also serve on the State Independent Living Council. And then there is an, a memorandum of agreement between tribal VR and state VR agencies that outlines what are the duties and responsibility of tribal VR, the duties and responsibility of the state agency, 
and providing services. Even though there's a travel VR program, the state still call, counts all members within the state. And that's how they get their allocation. And in some areas, there are dual cases. There is a dual case on an individual being served by travel VR and the state VR agency. So it's really, that was really important where before when we started, uh, some states, you know, were reluctant to have an MOA, but we wanted to put that into, into legislation to make sure that those things were happening. It was really important. So we put that as part of the amendments. So it was really important for, for them. So everybody understands what the roles and responsibilities, the, the, the agreement between the states and the travel VR, you know, it, it was really important mainly to meet the needs of travel, to, to meet the needs of, of tribe, of uh, American Indian and Alaska Natives. And then the other one was to require the RSA commissioner to fund all American Indian proposed that are, that are considered high quality by the peer reviewers. Even though there might not be enough allocation, if it's a fundable application, we felt that was really important that they're funded. And then of course, the 10 points and the higher priorities um, again, you know, the uh, three to five years uh, discretionary grants, TA monitoring, a travel VO programs. Um, so we just went down the list and said, these are things that are important to, to ensure that the travel VR programs are receiving the support system that they need and moving forward. Because under the travel VR, you know, the person has to have a permanent disability the how is the disabling condition, uh, you know, a barrier to employment that they will benefit from VR services. There will be an employment outcome. They have to be a member of a tribal or state recognized tribe. They have to live on and near the reservation. So th those are the two additional quali uh, eligibility criteria. Next. And then the list goes on, you know, um, you can read that for yourself. You know, I'm not gonna go through all of it, but uh, these were the 22 um, amendments that we've submitted during the 1996 amendments. Next. The National Cultural Diversity Initiative, as I indicated, was coordinated by Dr. Bobby Atkins with um, the San Diego State University, which you see here and then under the leadership of Dr. Fred McFarlane. He, I believe he's still there. Um, he also worked closely with Jimmy at San Diego State University. They were a very strong support system. We also worked closely with all the regional rehab, regional continuing ed program across the country. I believe there were 10 of them. Uh, they really provided the support to KNR, uh, the area of also professional development. Next. The KNR office, as I indicated, was established under UNC, University of Northern Colorado from 1993 to 96. Then after that, it transferred to NAU, to AirTech. It was there from 97 to 2002. And then from there, it moved to Louisiana. Louisiana was there for seven years and then it went to Michigan. And then now it's in Louisiana under the uh, leadership of Lenore Corral with the United Nation, Homa Nation. She's currently the president of KNAR. And these are the past presidents of KNAR. Uh, Rusty, Mike, Sydney, Joe, myself. Next. The allocation in 1990 before the KNAR was established was at 3.8 million with 14 programs. When you look at this all the way down to 1990, it went up to 17 million uh, with 55 programs. Next. And these are just some of the data based on the GEPRA data, that, that the reports that we submitted um, during uh, the years that you know the, the, the tribes were moving forward and providing their own services and providing an employment outcome. Because the main thing is that how do we achieve an employment outcome when we open the cases and provide the services? That was the main thing is that you know employment, that's what vocational rehabilitation is. Uh, and that they ensure that they maintain their employment. So there was such a thing as post-employment post services. Next. 
some of the uh, other history of uh, the 1990s is, you know, the VR eligibility that changed overall in the VHAP app from 90 days to 60 days. Um, but that doesn't mean that you determine eligibility until 60 days, you have to determine eligibility, but you had that leeway of doing that within 60 days. That was also very important because, um, you know, like on Navajo, it's a very rural community. So, you know, um, you either had to go travel, a lot of traveling sometimes was involved to meet with the consumers, to meet the ref with referrals that were coming that were coming in. And then handicap was changed to disability, impairment to impediment, employ employability to employment outcome, um, American Indians with handicap to American Indians with disabilities. You know, so these were some of the changes that were made. Also the consumers, unique strength, resources, priorities, all that was included. And then the individualized written rehabilitation plan was also changed to individualized uh, program employment plan. So, you know, the IPE, yes, that was also changed. Uh, transition and coordination between schools and VR, uh, that was also something that, which we call now transition. Um, and then the most important was meeting the needs of consumers with diverse population increasing minority professionals. That was also really important. Next. Some of the things that happened was also to evaluate the tribal VR programs. Are they really providing quality vocational rehabilitation services that are culturally rele uh, re relevant? You know, so one of the things that happened 97, 99 was the rehab services conducted 30 on-site program monitoring and evaluation to look at all these areas, the effectiveness, the quality, accountability, compliance, you know, employment outcome, and all areas of program operation and client services. Uh, the evaluators included state VR agencies, client assistance program, the state rehab council, Indian professionals in education, health, tribal government leaders, and these were the areas that were evaluated, the administration, the management, the case, and then they wanted to evaluate 50 cases of each of the 30 tribes that were identified, physical management, you know, the relationship between the state and the tribe, self-assessments, how are we doing our own assessment or evaluation to ensure that, you know, we are meeting these, these criteria. And then to conduct follow-up visits with the programs by RSA after they received their reports. With Navajo, we had, they had to evaluate 150 cases. And they said, since Navajo is such a large program, instead of just 50 cases, we have to evaluate 150 cases. And I said, well, as you guys are saying 50, but they said, that's just the way it's gonna be. So they evaluated 150 of our cases. And the overall outcome was, you know, that we were meeting all these criteria. There were some areas we needed to improve, you know, uh, policies um, and just nothing major was, was, there was really no major findings that we were providing quality VR services, that they were culturally appropriate. And, you know, they met with the staff, they met with their tribal leaders, they met with uh, clients in some areas, parents in some areas, and they, about, they interviewed them. And, you know, they just also uh, tribal leaders like tribal council, uh, tribal presidents or chairmen, and talking about tribal VR programs. That's, that was what, you know, was conducted during that time. In 1999, you know, they did they conduct another cluster evaluations in the four regions, the Southwest and Northwest. And that's where Richard Corbridge from RSA Region 10, when they had their RSA Region 10, he went across the country and he went on site to these tribal programs and conducted a cluster evaluations. Even though we were already evaluated, 
they, you know, they said that, well, we still need to do another one. So they did what they call a cluster evaluation. That also came out that we were providing quality VR services. They were culturally appropriate. We were putting people back into employment. We were doing the eligibility criteria, right? The services, you know, were clearly defined in the, uh, the service plans that we were putting out. Next. If that's not enough, they did another evaluation with development associates, you know, um, again for 30. And these are the areas that they evaluated, the overall evaluation of the overall quality, the effectiveness again. We went through that, you know, um, and every time we got evaluated, we were meeting the needs. We were putting individuals back into employment. Rather, it's uh, competitive employment, self-employment, you know, um, and we were, we had quality uh, case management systems. We were expending the funds. If we were, if there were any amendments to the cases, we were doing that. Uh, if there was any employment services or collaboration with the state agencies on dual cases, uh, or meeting with the state agencies on the SRC. So overall, you know, um, there was no major findings that was identified during these evaluation process. Next. And in the 1990, during the um, reauthorization, this was uh, identified the traditionally underserved population, the racial, the racial Profile and the rate of disabilities in American Indian is one half of one times of the general population. So, you know, uh, that was put into the Rehab Act and also to provide appropriate practitioners' knowledge, role models, you know, and then the, to the RSA Commissioner to, to develop policies to prepare minorities for career in VR. So, what was happening was that a lot of the tribal VR programs started um, enrolling with the different entities at universities across the country in the area of to get more knowledgeable about vocational rehabilitation and, you know, um, Southern University, San Diego State, Western Washington, and just across, you know, um, across the country. That's where the uh, regional rehab, regional continuing ed program played a major role in providing that support to us. Next. Um, the RSA capacity building projects was also established during this time to increase uh, Native American professionals in VR capacity building for grants with these individuals, you know, San Diego State, Western Washington University of Southern, Southern University, Assumption College up in Massachusetts, NAU, University of Northern Colorado, et cetera. And these were some of the key players, Mary Guillermo, um, Madan can do uh, Lee Gashioma, Win Winona Reed, and yours truly, Jimmy Warren. Next. On this section, I'd like to refer this over to Jimmy because you played a major role in this. Jimmy has really helped build the professionals um, of Native Americans and vocational rehabilitation. So, Jimmy. Ah, thank you, Treva. And it's been wonderful to get the history and seeing. Uh, well, reminding us how old we are <laughs> after all these years of working in uh, tribal vocational rehabilitation. And I'm a big fan of tribal voc rehab. Uh, the people out there doing the work uh, in the vocational rehabilitation programs, both with tribes, states, and communities are doing great work because it's based in empowerment. So empowerment for people with disabilities, empowerment for Indian country are the values that I have personally and that's why I devoted a big part of my career working with Tribal Voc Rehab at San Diego State University. Creating the Pet Air program was wonderful. And we had 15 years of funding. And it was a 21 unit certificate program that was transferable into uh, master's programs, not only at San Diego State, but at other uh, universities as well. When I developed this under the CARE, Center for American Indian Rehabilitation and Education, that was our umbrella within the Intwork Institute at San Diego State that uh, provided that uh, native specialized disability training and services and supports. 
and I was able to create some pet air certificate programs. And what was wonderful is the amount of travel VR programs we worked with. I believe we had representatives from over uh, 60 of the travel VR programs as students and participants, as well as people that were my uh, instructors. Treva obviously was one of my instructors and more than half of my uh, instructors were from Indian country disability specialty. So it was great to hear some of those old uh, names with Elmer Guy that was in there at Navajo really doing a lot of good work. Uh, I worked with NAU uh, TVR Circle program. I was asked to administer that program in partnership with San Diego State when I was at SDSU. So I was able to work with those folks and uh, uh, also create some training programs there. But uh, Pet Air was a wonderful program. Obviously, I'm biased because it, it was my, uh, my baby, if you will, in terms of providing continuing education opportunities for our travel VR counselors and professionals. So Pet Air, uh, Post-Employment Training American Indian Rehabilitation, really provided a lot of uh, folks. And I had over, I believe it was 85% of my students were from Indian country. And then the other students that I had that were non-Indian allies, as I like to say, were either working with Travel VR or with state agencies that wanted to better partner with the Travel VR programs in their particular states. So uh, I know that it was uh, a great experience working not only with the students and professionals from Travel VR from so many different tribal nations, but bringing us together in San Diego on campus so that we could not only learn new curriculum from my instructors, but also learn from each other. I think we had good team building opportunities so that many of the travel VR folks that are still working that have pet air certificates. And what I'm really proud of is 17 of those certificate uh, folks that earned their certificates use those units to transfer into the master's program. So uh, I believe there's one more slide on pet air. Uh, next, please. <clears throat> Yeah, so there were the one week uh, high intensives. I know uh, many of my students know, know me as the law man because I was always requiring <laughs> us to know the Rehabilitation Act. And uh, I was great to have Treva and uh, not only American Indian uh, instructors, but I was able to have a former RSA commissioner, Fred Schroeder, who was a great ally as the commissioner. We had the greatest growth and support when he was commissioner of Rehab Services Administration, and he saw and valued the work that we were doing in Indian country. So these uh, 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 trainees from the certificate program, many of them uh, moved on, as I said, to get their MS degree. And next slide, please. Uh, having uh, all those different students, here's some pictures. You see, oh, there's on the bottom is Fred Schroeder using uh, the cane for vision. And then there you see Dick Corbridge and Fred McFarlane and Treva was there to teach this group of students. So it was a wonderful experience. Unfortunately, uh, RSA decided to defund these programs. Uh, maybe I was teaching them too well regarding the law and regulations because I wanted our students, our tribal professionals to know the law inside and out so that they could advocate not only for their consumers, their clients, but for their program so that they could get the appropriate services and supports that they should be getting from our federal partners. So I always encourage you, even though Pet Air does not exist anymore, there's other training programs. I know that there's $5 million set aside for training, and I believe NAU has that grant for Tribal Voc Rehab. So they have a wealth of uh, information and training available for our tribal VR folks. And of course, we at the Native Center are always welcome to any disability professional, including tribal VR, because we value the work that you do so much. You're always welcome for any of our trainings and information that you want. So uh, Pet Air was a wonderful experience. Unfortunately, it does not exist, but we're trying to get it recreated through health and human services funding so that we have a disability, indigenous disability certificate utilizing the pet air model as well as some other new curriculum so that our disability uh, professionals have more access to education and training. So Treva, I hope I covered that okay for you. Thank you for the opportunity to share some good memories from the pet air program. Palamia. 
<laughs> Thank you, Jim. Uh, he really did a great job. You know, um, a lot of students, you know, came away with more knowledge about what vocational rehabilitation is. Um, Jim really came forward and has been a real leader in the area of vocational rehabilitation. And then he continues to advocate for individuals with disabilities. So, you know, um, I really appreciate that. And a lot of students remember their time at Pet Air. And I think that's where when we said we wanted to grow our own, that really was, you know, a, a turning point for us and also working with the other universities. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you. Next. As you can see, the allocation from 3.8 million went up to 43 million by 2014. And the programs went from, you know, 14 to 90. Uh, that will give you a uh, continuation grants, new grants uh, during this time. Next. And then this is some of the data of the number of individuals that were job placed that were in, achieve an employment outcome. Uh, that was the main thing that was looked at is that how are we providing the services, the employment outcome was something that we really had to hone in on. So in our grant, when, if we said we're going to serve 400 clients and job place 100 clients, you know, are we doing that? Are we meeting those needs? So it was really important that we put in the grant, you know, uh, achievable objectives that especially in um, Indian country, employment is not readily available. So it was really important that we had to be resourceful. And what do they call it? Think outside the box and moving and moving forward with our consumers. Next. And then this is currently, there are 91 um, travel VR programs in 25 states. And this is um, the numbers 12 in Alaska, you know, you can see how many travel VR programs is across the country. The majority of them are on the west side of the country. But, you know, we continue to advocate for tribes to apply for the grant, you know, for funding. It's really important. <clears throat> Even those that um, don't have, you know, um, travel VR programs, that's where these um, the website of KNR, uh, the conferences is really important. So the invitation is always open to them. Thank you. Next. And this is across the country. You know, there's 31 up in the Pacific, which includes Alaska, the Rocky Mountain area, the Southwest, the Midwest, and then the, both the Northeast and the Southeast regions uh, across the country. There are 91 in 25 states. Next. And then the history of the Workforce Investment Act, you know, that changed uh, significantly, you know, in, in, in two ways. Required that high quality employment outcome is important and consistent with the individual strength under the travel VR programs that the commissioner also reserved 1.8 to 2% of funding for training and technical assistance. That's where, um, And uh, Jimmy mentioned AirTAC, um, the American Indian uh, Vocational Rehabilitation Technical Assistance Center at NAU and also Northwest Indian College um, were funded as a tribal institute in 2005. They continue to operate um, uh, at NAU and also up in Bellingham, Washington. Today, you know, it's 46 years later, there are 92 programs and there's still a lot that needs to be done because there's over 300 recognized tribes across the country. And KNR is still, you know, operating under the leadership of Lenore Corral. So there's still, much, you know, we still have much to accomplish and move forward in this area. The other thing that's really important is transition of high school students. There's a lot of Indian students that are in special ed programs or students with disabilities that, you know, are needing the services. So the schools are all is also uh, an area that the, the travel VR programs are looking at and working with. Next. Next. Okay. Um, Why separate a tribal, why separate VR program from American and Alaska Natives? Um, 
They do not receive adequate services in some areas, the rural location, access to services, travel sovereignty, the language, the cultural barriers, the trust issues, transportation issues. These are just some of the issues that come to that come out of why um, some of them, you know, are not accessing services from the state agencies. That was the reason why it was important when Navajo Nation first established its tribal VR program. Because the, the, the employees, they worked, they spoke Navajo, they understood the location, they understood the environment, they understood the economic situations on, on the reservation. Uh, they knew what the challenges are, you know, the transportation issues, all these trust issues. Um, so that's the reason why, you know, travel VR program is really important uh, in Indian country in collaboration and coordinating with the state VR agencies. Next. And then this is what travel VR is, you know, I believe that I already went over this, you know, is to provide uh, VR services that's culturally appropriate, you know, to individuals with disabilities of American Indian and the federal and state reservations consistent with their strengths, and then to engage in high quality employment that will increase opportunities for economic self-sufficiency. Next. And when I talked about culturally appropriate services, the Navajo Nation uses this model of the four directions. The North is the spiritual resilience, citizen for work and independence. To the East is the intake, the mental, the thinking, not case. The South is the eligibility, the plan for services, the planning, not And the West is emotional, the implementation of services, ina. So, you know, so that's the, the, the middle is the um, Navajo basket. It's always open to the East. And this is what we, this was the, this is the model that we use and providing our services from the cultural, from the cultural standpoint. Next. And this is the Navajo reservation. As you can see, it's located in a tri-state, uh, Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona. Uh, Fort Mojave down in uh, Arizona is also in a tri-state, Nevada, Arizona, and California. Uh, the program in Georgia also serves consumers in Florida. Um, the lower, lower rule up in North and South Dakota extends both into North and South Dakota. So in some areas like for Navajo, they have to have a cooperative agreement with New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah VR, VR agencies. So, you know, it's um, um, because of the, the way the reservation is set up, you know, it's, it's important that we work collaboratively with this free state agency. We also, you know, uh, work closely sometimes with Colorado. Next. And then this is just some comparison between the tribal VR and the state VR agencies. You know, with the, with the tribes, there's the tribal government. Some tribes, not all tribal VR programs is under education. Some of them are under labor, health, and tribal colleges. There's a 10% there's a match with 90% from the federal. There's a cooperative agreement. There's the service areas on near reservation. We serve uh, American Indians and Alaskan Natives, enrolled members. We have to establish our own policies and procedures, program physical management. In some cases, the state Travel VR directors carry caseloads, professional development and training, you know, that's something that we have to work on. Uh, partnership network, comparable services, public awareness, that's really important. There are dual cases. Um, some programs have only three staff, others have 20 or more. The eligibility, you know, there are six criteria for that. It's a five year competitive grant, it's not guaranteed. Collaboration is key. And then we have to serve on the SRC, the State Independent Living Council, and then the annual reporting determines if we have, if we're gonna to continue to be funded. And then of course, you know, we work with KNR. Under the, Fed, under the state government, they have a state government. There are matches there, you know, it's a formula funding, you know, it's my population per capita income. So, you know, they don't, they don't have to reapply. They have a cooperative agreement, you know, they, work, you know, statewide, Commonwealth, you know, like in Region 10, Guam, uh, 
They serve all persons with disabilities. They already have set policies and procedures. They have district supervisors. They have VR counselors. They have support staff. They have job coaches and all that. They have staff development that they're funded for training component assistive technology. In some states, blind service agencies operate separate. They have independent living programs and centers. They can have community rehab programs. They have more offices, probably 500 staff. They have a reporting system. They have an order of selection, you know, and then all these, the three states that we work with. And then, you know, the national, uh, the independent living unit, you know, they have all these support systems. So you can see the compare, I mean, you can see the differences between in some areas, you know, there are some the same, but, uh, you know, the state's already established with the travel VO program. If it's a new program, they have to establish their own policies. They have to establish their forms and all that. So when we came together as tribes, what one of the things we did is that we said, we're not competitors, we're gonna help each other. So we shared policies and procedures, we shared forms. So that's how, you know, we were coming together and supporting one another. Next. All right, Chuiva, just wanted to let you know that uh, we have five more minutes. I'm not okay. sure. If... Yeah, I'll, 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 that's fine. And then the employment outcome is, you know, anything from motor vehicle to if the person wants to become a medicine person to carpentry, work in the office next. And then one shoe doesn't fit all. A person who is visually impaired, another client who is visually impaired is not the same. You know, uh, we need to make sure that there's guidance, there's direction, there's options, choices, opportunities, and support for self-sufficiency. Next. Yeah, that's what I have. I don't know if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Treva. And if there's some questions, please put it in the chat or raise your hand uh, if you have that availability. So if there's some questions, I know she covered uh, the past 30 years of tribal VR, more than that, actually, when you think of how Navajo Nation started with that $5,000 demonstrations grant with Arizona. And now we're at multi-millions of dollars of um, providing uh, services and supporting various tribes voc rehab programs. So it's wonderful to see that growth over the years. But as Treva mentioned, where there's still a lot of room for growth because we're still considered underserved and unserved populations. So we definitely need more, uh, more uh, partnership and uh, working together for our people. <clears throat> Any questions that you can see, Jeff? Have we missed anybody? I didn't see anything, um, just some kudos. Uh, got one from Kendall, thank you very much. Very enlightening. Oh, wonderful. Yes, this is a, a great opportunity. Again, we're gonna be doing these monthly. Next month, uh, I'll be leading a panel uh, in partnership with the Oyate Circle, our sister program. So in South Dakota, uh, we've been able to create this uh, Sonoran Native Center utilizing that model of the Oyate Circle in South Dakota so that we could uh, uh, continue services for Arizona tribes as well. And I believe there's another question, stepfather. Alaska. Jimmy, I was gonna. Uh, Jimmy, I was gonna say that if uh, folks want a copy of the PowerPoint, they can have it. Very good. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, the the cultural issues, and that's why it's so important to have folks on staff and Indian people trained in disability expertise to run these tribal programs. So we do the best we can to have uh, folks that know the culture that are working within these programs, but there's many resources available. I know up in Alaska, I did a uh, video series for Aleutian Privilof about voc rehab. Uh, there's some other uh, resources that are Alaska Native specific as well. So hopefully you can get those cultural appropriate services that are appropriate for your particular tribal nation. So there are some uh, uh, resources. NAU, again, has the uh, Avertech. So they specialize in providing training for travel VR specifically. So they have a wealth of information as well. Hopefully that will be able to help you. And then, of course, uh, Treva and I and our staff at the Native Center here are always available by email. So if you could uh, put up our emails or you can find us on our 
uh, website for any further clarification or questions, as well as suggestions for future um, uh, webinars that we'll be doing on a monthly basis. Next uh, month, as I said, we'll be doing one in combination with Oyate Circle that I'll be leading a, a panel of folks from Indian Country Disability so we can discuss some of the pan-Indigenous approaches that we have with the 22 tribes in Arizona, as well as all the urban Indians there, as well as the nine reservation communities in South Dakota and the other tribes that we have uh, in South Dakota as well. We wanna start looking at a pan-Indigenous model so that all tribal uh, folks can benefit from disability services. So again, we do appreciate you participating today. This is our official second uh, webinar for the Native Center at Sonoran Center for Disabilities. And we're very excited to create this program and uh, we should have our official director uh, uh, hired here soon with the paperwork and we can announce our new staff that will be working not only with the Native Center, but with our uh, Finds Their Way Youth Transition Program. So again, we appreciate your participation and feel free to contact us anytime. And we look forward to seeing you next month for our next webinar. Palamia, thank you so much, Treva, for sharing your story and your expertise with us today. Yeah, thank you. Palamia, take care, everybody. You too. Have a great weekend. You. Thank you, Jeffrey. Yeah, sure. thanks, Jeff. Appreciate your help.